Step up to craft beer. Taino Light Lager has a crisp, refreshing, Caribbean-style flavor. Boricua Craft Ale, full-bodied flavor for the true beer drinker. Stop drinking beer water. Taino Craft Light Lager and Boricua Strong Craft Ale. Feel the rhythm and come up to craft beer. Tap rooms are localized and they're geographic. The Hispanic community is much broader than one tap room. So what we decided to do was come out with a high quality craft beer, two high quality craft beers that appeal to the Hispanic taste and that we can distribute in all the Hispanic neighborhoods. Taino is a very light, refreshing beer. It's a, it's a social beer that you can drink probably for a good part of the evening and it'll give you a nice light feeling. It's not a heavy beer, it's very airy and it's very light, it's a 4.5 alcohol which is low for beer. The Boricua is a 6.0. Now that's a stronger beer, and we designed it to be a little bit stronger than Heineken. Heineken is a favorite in the Hispanic community, so we have a little bit more muscle than Heineken. Boricua, Boricua right now, in a very short amount of time, it's been a miracle for us because we've gotten a, a large range of acceptance at the retail level. We're in Publix, we're in ABC, Target is picking it up, we're in Sedano's, we're in Bravo's, 7-Elevens are picking it up because they're concentrating more on craft beer and the Hispanic market. So what we're trying to do is do a quality beer, a high quality beer, more taste, and that the Hispanic community will like. Mira, ¿dónde tú estás? Ya estoy aquí, mi vida. Ay. ¿Pero qué están tomando? ¿Pero por qué? Porque me traje lo nuevo y diferente. Taino Light Boricua Beer. Y lo más importante es que es lo nuevo y acabadita de salir al mercado. ¿Y saben bueno? Claro, ambas cervezas tienen los mismos beneficios que una copa de vino. Con menos calorías. La Boricua Beer, 6%. Fuerte, pero con sabor. Y la Taino Light, 4.5%. Y es artesanal. Es Somos familia. Calidad y sabor. Visita boricuabeer.com Hola Florida, introducing Boricua Beer and Taino Light Beer. Boricua and Taino Light are crafted beers that are rich in flavors and brewed right here in Florida. Taino Beer has a crisp, refreshing Caribbean flavor style when enjoyed chilled. Boricua Beer is a craft L with full body flavor that is a beer drinker's beer. Boricua and Taino Light Beers, enjoy responsibly. Welcome back to Hispanic Speak Out. My name is Danny Ramos, and I'm here every Tuesday night at 9.30 p.m. to bring you news in the Hispanic community. And my guest today is Tony Suarez, um, who was in the first segment. But I got some other things to talk to him about besides Puerto Rico that Tony's involved with. So we only got about 12 minutes left, so I want to split this a little bit. All right. Okay. Whenever I hear the major news media, they always go, Hispanic. Right. And then when you go talk to Puerto Ricans, they say, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican. The Cubans say, I'm Cuban. The Mexicans say, I'm Mexican. Right. So is there such thing as a Hispanic or is that a convenience yeah. for media to group us all together so that people believe we have common issues? Because I know we don't have common issues. Puerto Ricans don't have the same issues that Mexican-Americans have. No, not, not all, but there are some, like bilingual education will probably be mm -hmm. one. Um, but, but generally, yes, you're correct. There, Hispanic is a... Is a uh, a general term that doesn't really mean anything. I don't even remember the, uh, uh, where it came from, but uh, probably from Hispana. Uh, but I, I think it's a matter of political convenience. It's political convenience, yeah, because they are, these are they're different cultures, and the Cuban is different than Puerto Rican, although yeah. not, you know, not we all like the same kind of music, but we have different beans. And yeah. <laughs> they say that Puerto, R Puerto Latinos are divided by their beans, you know. Uh, <laughs> That's probably true. Because, yeah, you yeah. Know, everybody's got their specialty of their beans. Uh, but overall, there are, there are differences culturally, yes. Yeah, and the, the media, whenever you listen to CNN, whenever you listen to Fox or MSNBC, they say the Hispanic vote. Right. Well, the Hispanic vote is really broken down into different pockets. The major pockets are Southwest, Southeast, Puerto Rico, you know, Puerto right. Ricans. Right. And they don't mention that Puerto Ricans are Puerto Ricans. They just go Hispanic. Right. And it's always like I said... These guys aren't, when they talk about the Hispanic vote and the Hispanic population, they're talking about as if they have the same approach. As same if it was homogeneous. Yeah, and it it's is not, not homogeneous. It's not. It's not. Um, and, uh, you know, Puerto Ricans, for the most part, are, are dem Democrats, but not all. Yeah. Uh, and, and Cubans are mostly Republicans, but not all. 
Right. Um, and I would say the same thing with, with Mexicans. But the issues are different. The Mexicans are most, mostly concerned with immigration, and, and, Port and Cubans are mostly concerned about their government and Castro and communism, mm. and Puerto Ricans are worried about the statehood issue. Yeah. Those are major issues for those communities, and that's their principal concern. Yeah. So there are differences. Okay. Now let's jump the fence and go to Corrine Brown. Okay. <laughs> you are involved in the Corrine Brown. Uh, case which is coming to a conclusion it's going to jury right, right. it's in jury phase it's correct okay so how long do you think the jury will be out well first you know I represent a ch her chief of staff um, okay. with a gentleman by the name of Ronnie Brown uh, Ronnie Simmons excuse me uh, Ronnie Simmons is the her chief of staff and um, he was charged indicted with Kareem Brown in a corruption wire fraud um, case uh, I analyzed the evidence it was 98,000 documents Danny uh, I, I had a lot of homework to do, to read the documents and to prepare for the trial. I don't but, think I've read 98,000 documents <laughs> in my whole life. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as I go through the documents and I see the evidence piling up, I turn around to my client and I show them, explain this to me, explain this to me. And as he could not explain a lot of the documents, I'm saying, my friend, you're going to go to jail if, with, with, based on this evidence that I have here in front of me. You've got to make uh, choices in your life. You go to trial or you make a deal. If you go to trial based on the evidence I have in front of me, it, it, to me, a jury is going to convict you. Uh, eventually, uh, after I showed him enough of the evidence, he, he was convinced himself that what he needed to do was not go to trial and try to make a deal with the government. And that's what we did. Now, part of that deal with the government was that he would have to testify. And that was very difficult because Ronnie Simmons was very close, 30-year relationship with, with the congresswoman. So that was not an easy decision. Uh, for him to make to testify against his boss, his friend of so many years. But nonetheless, that was part of the deal. Part of the, uh, of the process, also you know, from a criminal point of view, it, when you admit the guilt, you, it's really a catharsis to get r rid of it and just come clean. Mm -hmm. And that's only the beginning of healing because there's also a psychological part to this. Yeah, you, you, you did something wrong, you have to admit you did something wrong, you may have to go to jail. But part of it to go, what's the rest of your life going to be like? In order to, to deal with the rest of your life, you have to just accept it, clean yourself up, and go forward. And part of that is testifying, and in, in, uh, in this particular, you have to stand in front of her and testify against her. And this is all coming down now. That's correct. Immediately. As so, we speak, uh, the jury's out. All right, so this, this may come to a conclusion in the next few days. That's correct. In the yeah. next few days. That's right. There are 22 counts indictment against her. And uh, you know now the jury has to go down each one of those counts to determine whether the government has proved this case beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, and what's your take on it? Well, because the jury's out, um, and because this come out, who knows if this um, tape could be in the hands of a juror mm -hmm. somehow. I, mm -hmm. I'm going to not comment mm -hmm. on that. I could tell you that I advise my client based on the evidence that I saw that it was a very strong case. It would have been a strong case against me. It would have been a strong case uh, uh, against Kareem. What the jury saw after they did the cross-examination, it's for a jury. You never know what a jury is going to do. But um, I know that from my advice as a professional this year, 40 years as a trial lawyer, uh, I advise my client to take the plea. Okay. All right, this is, uh, we're done, okay? So okay. <laughs> listen, it's been great having you two Very shows good. in a row. We're going right. to do this back to back. This is Danny Ramos on Hispanic Speak Out TV. We will see you next week with some more interesting people to talk with. Okay, we'll see you next week. Step up to craft beer. Dino Light Lager has a crisp, refreshing Caribbean style flavor. Boricua Beer Craft Ale, full body flavor for the true beer drinker. Stop drinking beer water. Craft Light Lager and Boating West Strong Craft Ale. Feel the rhythm. Step up to craft. Step up to craft beer. Taino Light Lager has a crisp, refreshing Caribbean style flavor. Boricua Craft Ale, full bodied flavor for the true beer drinker. Stop drinking beer water. Taino Craft Light Lager and Boricua Strong Craft Ale. Feel the rhythm and come up to craft beer. Hi, I'm Danny Ramos and welcome to this week's edition of Hispanic Speak Out brought to you on Spectrum. 
every Tuesday night at 9.30 for the past 13 years, previously on Bright House. We're here to talk about uh, issues that affect the Hispanic community, and we invite uh, Hispanic leaders here and leaders that maybe not Hispanic, but do have a major influence on the issues that Hispanics face. Um, I'm here with uh, a new state rep who just um, uh, was elected recently, and he passed his first uh, uh, segment of uh, leadership up in the legislative body in Tallahassee. And his name is uh, Representative Smith, uh, Guillermo Smith. And um, I want to welcome you to the show. And you've been here before. And I'm so, this is the first time that you're here as an elected official, though. Yes, yes. And thank you for having me, Danny. I yeah, appreciate you know, it. it's, it's, it, you know, I've seen you go through a, a, I'm sure a lot of people have seen you go through transitions. And, I, and I, I've seen you go through transitional points because, you know, sometimes when you're with people, you don't see the changes, you know what I mean, in a person as they go through a growth period. But I remember when you first wanted to run, I remember when you started to run, and now you've become elected, which is really terrific. <laughs> you have a, a great political future going ahead. Well, thank you. I yeah. feel like I've remained the same. <laughs> uh, I'm the same uh, person that no, I was I, You know something? I, uh, <laughs> you, and I'm sure you do. What are you saying? Uh, what I'm <laughs> saying is that you've gone through a, uh, a process that I see politically, a political process of, of getting uh, uh, a maturity to you politically that, you know, of course, the person with the, when they first start out, you know, and say, I want to run, that's a whole different person. And when you go through a campaign, you get the hard knocks, you get beat up, and you survive, and then you go into an election, and you survive. And that changes a person's, the way they see and handle life, you know? Mm -hmm, and, I, mm -hmm. and, and I think you've gone through that process in a wonderful way. Thank you. Well, yeah. you gotta have thin, thick skin thin, when yeah. you are uh, in politics. If you have thin skin, then uh, politics is probably not for you. Yeah. Politics is not for the faint of heart mm -hmm. or for people who are easily offended. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah, really, really. And you have to have a desire to be of service. Absolutely. Uh, an overwhelming desire to be of service. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, I've seen through all of my years that a lot of times, you know, a lot of people, when they go through the political structure, they change after a while. You know, they have these idealistic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and again, in politics, when you go into a situation like that, you, it's a compromised situation in order to get things done, you know, and, and that changes people. Um, but I'm glad, I'm glad you got elected. Congratulations. Thank what you. What a wonderful thing. Appreciate it. So let's talk a little bit about... Um, I know that you've been very proactive. You know, Pulse was the number one, besides uh, the World Trade Center, the number one uh, terrorist um, occurrence in the United States as far as uh, deaths, the number of deaths that happened during that uh, effort. Um, how, has had, how, has, did, how has, did that affect your campaigns and your politics? Um, what happened with Pulse? Because I know you were very involved with supporting it and going through it. And I know that um, also there was uh, some issues, and I think I asked you one time that you were here previously, was um, uh, Pulse a political um, a terrorist happening, or was it, what was the target of it? You know, And I'll ask you again, when Pulse occurred, when that happened, what was the target of the person who actually um, perpetrated that? Well, the thing about the tragedy at Pulse is that it was a very complicated, horrific uh, act of violence. It was not any one particular thing. It was many things. It was an act of terror. It was a mass shooting. And it was the worst hate crime inflicted on the LGBTQ community in United States history. It was all of these things mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important that when we talk about the tragedy at Pulse, that we talk about all of these things so that we're not inadvertently rewriting history, um, if you understand what I mean. Because mm -hmm. when folks talk about the tragedy and don't acknowledge first that the community targeted and impacted uh, was the LGBTQ and the Latino community. Uh, it, it inadvertently rewrites history for the there future was, generations that look back and they're yeah. gonna say, oh, it was, it was just another mass shooting amongst many mass shootings. No, it was a hate crime. In the very beginning, you know, when, when it first happened, there was a lot of conversation where it was identified as a mass shooting, a terrorist attack, and there was a little bit of resistance by some people that 
it involved a specific community, a specific way of thought, and the Hispanic community. So there was a pushback with people that were saying, no, 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 that wasn't against the Hispanic community, and that wasn't against uh, the, the, the gay community. It was, it was a very specific terrorist attack period. And we know that to be different now. But that whole thing changed, I think, you know, in, in Spanish, no hay mal de que bien no venga, you know? Mm. It was a horrific, horrific tragedy. And, and um, I know some police officers that were on site and went inside. And they had to go on the therapy. That's how bad it was, what they saw. Um, but um, it changed the way many Americans looked at that community, that particular community. It, it you know, it was kind of like, before that, there was a lot of resistance to the community, you know, and there was a lot of conflict with the mm -hmm, community. Mm -hmm. After Pulse, it, it brought it into a very human, we are people, we pain, we die, we are part of you, mm -hmm. we're part of America. And I think that that particular event, and you can tell me if you feel I'm wrong or not, actually was a transitional event for the attitudes of Americans on a national level. Yes, um, I saw a lot of that firsthand. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw, you know, if, if there is going to be a silver lining from such a horrific tragedy, it is that uh, it became a transformational moment, at least in Central Florida and in Orlando, for many uh, faith leaders of many different uh, religions mm -hmm. uh, and denominations mm -hmm. to really self-reflect uh, and, and figure out how can what is what does this say about us as not only as a faith community but also us the human condition yeah how accepting are we of others mm -hmm. uh, do we necessarily need to change our faith or the way that we interpret our religion mm -hmm. to treat others specifically the lgbtq community with love and respect yeah um and what i saw encouraged me um, and, and I'm not just talking about folks from the Muslim and Islamic community but also folks from the evangelical and Pentecostal mm -hmm. community many of them Hispanic pastors who opened their arms up mm -hmm. in the aftermath of the tragedy of Pulse and, and opened their doors and welcomed the LGBTQ community so the question is is has that uh, sentiment and has that attitude remained one year later, mm -hmm. is that still happening? Well, has it? Has it? I think that it has. I mean, there's certainly more uh, opportunity to keep heading in that direction and to get even more folks to open their arms and open their doors. Mm -hmm. But that's where the that's the direction that things are going in, and that that gives me that gives me comfort. Yeah, I you know when when you said it's you know definitely Central Florida, I think it had a national impact for two reasons. Number one. It was an act against a minority community as well, Hispanics. There was no question. And I think that the Hispanic communities across the nation felt that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that it created a tremendous impact in New York because of the large population of Puerto Ricans and Hispanics in New York, certainly in Florida, certainly in Texas, certainly in California. So I think that brought that community almost to a, a concept of prayer, you know, because it was such a devastating concept and I think it brought to the table a lot of people that were resisting, you know, the concept of, of the uh, community and what it stands for and what it represents. And I think that it made a lot of people cross the bridge, you know, put that, that feeling, that uneducated feeling behind them. Yeah, some, uh, some, silver, some silver lining there. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of actionable things mm -hmm. that at least our political leaders could have done and need to do to respond to uh, a tragedy like Pulse, to one, uh, try to prevent these tragedies from happening again, but also to make sure that folks in the community have the resources that they need mm -hmm. to try to rebuild. Um, and that's what I have been focusing on because, you know, when I, you talked about how I ran for office and announced that I was running in 2015 as a candidate, that this tragedy happened in, in the middle of all of that. And the context in which I'm bringing that up is that the tragedy at Pulse changed the needs of the community and what the, uh, what, what the priorities of our community were. And so along with that, my 
priorities and goals as a lawmaker also changed. Mm -hmm. You know, I started fighting harder for access to mental health care services mm -hmm. and making sure that folks uh, specifically who were suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, had places to go to treat that condition. Uh, this last legislative session, I'm proud to have worked with Senator Stewart. We secured two and a half million dollars in funding for the PTSD clinic at UCF, mm -hmm. which started as a program that was treating veterans. Mm -hmm. But with this additional money, we'll be able to expand their work and treat first responders and survivors from the tragedy at Pulse. And I think that that's a major step forward because folks are running out of places to go to get treatment for mental health care. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because Florida is 50th in the nation. We are dead last in funding for mental health care services. And what do you attribute to that? Because Florida, to me, has gone through a major transition since I got here. I got here in 1997. There was not one Hispanic elected official at that time. I think the first one was Guavera and Kissimmee and then John Quinones in 2001. Um, but what do you attribute that to? I mean, this is not a backwards community. We, we are the center of tourism in the Western Hemisphere, Orlando, because of all the theme parks. So how do, how do we land up to be number 50? Well, it, it all has to do with priorities and values. Every year when state lawmakers vote on the whole budget, this year it was an 83 billion, billion with a B, dollar budget for the entire state of Florida. That the budget is a reflection of the values and priorities of the lawmakers who put it together. And unfortunately, mental health care has not ranked near the top of their list of priorities year after year after year. And we have seen the, uh, the uh, focus on making this uh, an important priority for Florida has, has deteriorated over years and unfortunately has not gotten much better since the tragedy at Pulse when we need it most. Okay, so how do you change that? I mean, you're you're, what you're saying is, is that the people who are supposed to make it happen are resistant in making it happen. They're the lawmakers, they're the people. So what makes them tick not to understand that mental health is a major critical issue in our country, especially with all the psychological pressures that all of our citizens and society lives under? You know, mental health is, is uh, you know, there's so many tragedies that have happened that were related to that? Well, I think with, uh, with education comes understanding. Take the issue of uh, PTSD, post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress disorder. Uh, many folks don't understand that PTSD is a very serious and in some cases debilitating condition. Look, we're gonna take a little break right now. We're gonna continue after the break. She signaled me for a break and then we'll continue. Uh, this is Danny Ramos on Hispanic Speak Out. We're gonna take a one minute break and then we'll be right back. Now. It is the kind of weekend where an ice cold beverage is probably the thing you want. A local businessman launching his own craft beer company and he's targeting Hispanic customers. He's at the Sentinel today to tell us more about this new beer, Caitlin. Yeah, so actually you took the words out of my mouth, Andrea. I was thinking whether uh, a nice weekend means maybe a nice cold brewski. And I actually have Kyle Arnold, who's our restaurant and retail reporter in-house. And Kyle, you know, craft beer is a trend, but it seems that we have a, one local brewer taking it to sort of the next step. And I let's talk about uh, Boricua craft beer and Taino beer, which is like sort of its lighter sister beer. So talk to me about those two products. Yeah, exactly. It was a beer that was launched here a couple months months ago by a local company at Altamont Springs. Uh, Danny Ramos is running it. It's being uh, produced up in Cape Canaveral at Florida Beer Company. Uh, and it is a beer that is, you know, hoping the Boricua name means Puerto Rican. Uh, there's a huge population of Puerto Ricans here hoping that he can, uh, you know, create a connection between those people to uh, get his name out. Um, so uh, when I think of craft beer, you know, I think uh, it, it certainly targets a, a specific audience, but he's taking it a step further. Can you elaborate more on why target the Hispanic population? Yeah, there's uh, like 
500,000 Hispanics in this area. Two hundred, sure. About half of those are Puerto Ricans, and a lot of Puerto Ricans and a lot of Hispanics are in that millennial age group, just like the rest of the country. And those people are kind of disregarding the uh, the beers their parents grew up with, and they want local beers. They want things that cater a little bit more to their taste, a little bit higher quality, and they're willing to pay for it. Sure. And so, where locally can we find this? Uh, there's a couple publics around town in some of the bigger Hispanic pocket, pockets of town. Mm -hmm. Sedano's, Bravo's, there's a bunch of 7-Elevens. You can find them almost at all the ABC uh, Wine and Spirits. They have a pretty big craft beer selection. Excellent. And so I know uh, it doesn't. this isn't the only uh, brewery or brewer looking to target this market. Who else is popping up na you know, nationally? Yeah, there's some companies out of like Southern California, like Ohana Brewing. Um, there's some other ones. What's really interesting about Boricua is I really haven't found many others that target Hispanics specifically. And you already see that done in the mass beer market with Corona, exactly. uh, Dos Equis things. Uh, you know, Mexico is a pretty big beer market. Um, but uh, as in terms of Americans, they've really kept it general so far, either uh, localities like Orlando Brewing or, or Fat Tire, just mm -hmm. a generic term out of uh, Colorado. Excellent. And I just want to know, what has the reception been? If it's only been launched for a few months, what are what's the kind of feedback you're getting on this? It's doing pretty well in some restaurants around town, um, especially some uh, like Puerto Rican restaurants that they really only offer, you know, some of the big international beers, uh, Heineken and things like that. They bring in a local beer. It says craft brew. Uh, it's got a local tie to it. And people want to try it, especially tourists from out of town. They want to, you know, see what the local flavor is. And, and so far, it's it's been good. Excellent. So we have a local entrepreneur, a local, a local brewer here uh, targeting a very specific market uh, within a larger market. So we'll just have to see how Boricua goes from here but you know if we're seeing all these temperatures I myself might crack one this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should Caitlin. Cheers to that. What a terrific idea. Cheers. All right. <laughs> Thanks for watching this video. You can watch Orlando News Now every weekday on OrlandoSentinel.com. We go live at noon. See you then. Tap rooms are localized and they're geographic. The Hispanic community is much broader than one tap room. So what we decided to do was come out with a high quality craft beer, two high quality craft beers that appeal to the Hispanic taste and that we can distribute in all the Hispanic neighborhoods. Taino is a very light, refreshing beer. It's a, it's a social beer that you can drink probably for a good part of the evening and it will give you a nice light feeling. It's not a heavy beer, it's very airy and it's very light. It's a 4.5 alcohol, which is low for beer. The Boricua is a 6.0. Now that's a stronger beer. And we designed it to be a little bit stronger than Heineken. Heineken is a favorite in the Hispanic community, so we have a little bit more muscle than Heineken. Boricua, Boricua right now, in a very short amount of time, it's been a miracle for us because we've gotten a, a large range of acceptance at the retail level. We're in Publix, we're in ABC, Target is picking it up, we're in Sedano's, we're in Bravo's, 7-Elevens are picking it up because they're concentrating more on craft beer and the Hispanic market. So what we try to do is do a quality beer, a high quality beer, more taste, and that the Hispanic community will like. Mira, ¿dónde tú estás? Ya estoy aquí, mi vida. Ay. ¿Pero qué están tomando? ¿Pero por qué? Porque me traje lo nuevo y diferente. Taino Light Boricua Beer. Y lo más importante es que es lo nuevo y acabadita de salir al mercado. ¿Y saben bueno? Claro, ambas cervezas tienen los mismos beneficios que una copa de vino. Con menos calorías. La Boricua Beer 6%. Fuerte, pero con sabor. Y la Taino Light 4.5% y es artesanal. Es Somos familia. Calidad y sabor. Visita boricuabeer.com. En el vecindario todo es fiesta y alegría Porque ya el boricua tiene la cerveza que quería Hay baile en el vecindario todo es fiesta y alegría Porque ya el boricua tiene lo que el boricua quería Dame una boricua fría para celebrar la ocasión Dino Light Lager has a crisp, refreshing Caribbean style flavor. Boricua Beer Craft Ale, full body flavor for the true beer drinker. Stop drinking beer water. Dino Craft Light Lager and Boricua Strong Craft Ale. Feel the rhythm. Step up to craft.
como yo.